Welcome to the final episode of season two of the Eric Norcross podcast. We've finally arrived here. I can't believe it. Two full seasons of this show has been produced and gone out. And honestly, like, like I knew, I always knew I was capable of getting here, of going this far. I always knew that I was capable of going even further than this, but to know that you can do something and to actually do it are two different things. And as creative people, you probably understand that feeling. Like, you know you can do it, but it's still remarkable when you've done it. And with this particular podcast, like, I started this in the thick of the pandemic because I just really wanted to talk creativity. I wanted to talk creative process, and there were no community outlets to be able to do that. Everybody was under lockdown. And so... When I started this podcast, the first 10 or so episodes was just me talking to you. I didn't have guests. I didn't have plans to do interviews. I wasn't having conversations with other people. I was just talking to you about my productivity, about my creativity, how I stay busy, how I'm able to juggle so many different projects. And I wanted to demystify my process for you. It wasn't until the middle to latter half of season one that it became a conversation-based show where I would bring on a guest and just talk with them about their work and their creative process while also mixing and matching their experiences with my own. At the end of season one, I decided that the final episode of that season was going to be me talking to you again. Just me. And the reason I did that was because I want that early version of this show to to sort of bookmark the end of each season. Does that make sense? Or bookend the end of each season? Why would we bookmark the end of the season? Anyway, this is the end of season two. Again, I'll just be talking to you. I have a list of things that we're going to go over. A little bit of housekeeping on what to expect with the podcast moving forward. Some of the creative projects I've done that are now available for you to digest and judge. <laughs> um, and of course, I actually have a q and I, I, I've reached out into the social media and the emails and the website and kept a log of the most interesting and important questions I've received over the course of season two. And so the idea is... I'm going to answer some of those questions. I'm not going to answer all the questions because some of them were a a wee bit rude, a, a little off-putting. I got the sense that some of the people asking these questions weren't interested in real answers. They were just interested in making me feel doubt about what I was doing. So I won't be answering those questions, but I will be answering some really good questions. And then I'm going to talk about what to expect from me creatively this year and what to expect next year because I have a big plan and I want to talk to you guys about it. I haven't had the opportunity to use my podcast to talk about what I'm doing and that is of course where this all began. So what to expect from this podcast moving forward. So just like last year, I go on on hiatus during the summer, but the hiatus is more of a release hiatus. I'm still recording conversations for the show, I'm just not producing them as frequently as I would while the show is releasing every single week. So after this episode, the feed will go silent for a while. In August, I'll upload a new trailer. And you guys be able you guys will be able to listen to the new trailer and you'll also be able to watch it on YouTube. And then in September, episodes will resume. I'm going to try to do it every week like I've been doing these past two seasons. But there's a very real possibility that I might do it bi-weekly. And really the reason is just because the growth of the show uh, from an economic standpoint has been super slow. Uh, Resources are tight. And the biggest resource that I have is time. Right? So the more time I spend on the podcast, the less time I'm spending on my creative work. And I need to put more towards my creative work uh, because let's face it, uh, the podcast 
is meant to anchor the creative work. But if the podcast isn't yielding the financial results, then I need to, I'm not going to say put it on the back burner or stop doing it because I actually really like podcasting, but I don't want to put as much energy and or as much time into the show if the listenership isn't growing. And right now the listenership has been stuck at the same number for the past three months. And it did well during, it, it was doing much better during the latter half of the autumn and the first part of the winter. But in the latter half of the winter, the subscription stagnated. And so I got to figure out from a business standpoint, like one, how do I keep them from going stagnant and keep them growing? And two, how do I turn that into money? Because let's face it, you know, we function in a world that requires you to have money. Money is the most important resources. You are all artists. You understand this. You're, some of you are scientists. You understand the importance of funding. And so without funding for the podcast, I have to, I have to you know, weigh uh, whether or not to either keep doing it, and if I do keep doing it, does it make sense to put all this time and energy into continuing to try to do it every week? So I'm optimistic things will change this summer so that when we launch season three, I can do it every week. But there's a possibility that it's going to have to go by weekly. So moving forward, summer hiatus, just like I did last year. I'll continue to produce episodes, but they're going to be cataloged and archived and released for season three. Season three launches in September, possibly bi-weekly. But you'll still get conversations with creative people. I've already got a few interviews lined up. And you'll still get podcasts that are not necessarily with creative people, but are also interesting. And we're going to talk about that in a bit. Because this season, my podcast kind of went in a couple of different directions than just creativity. And, and I wanted to talk to you guys about that because that was one of the questions that came in over the winter. So... Now that you know what to expect from the show, what have I been doing creatively? Well, my film Fractals is finished and it's out. If you haven't seen it yet, it's on Prime Video. You can rent it or buy it. If you buy it, it's only $5 and then you get to own it. Now, Fractals is the sister film of Death and Life, my movie from 2016 or 2017. And they kind of go together. And since they're both available on Prime Video, I recommend just buying both. They're both the same price and... They both belong in the same collection. Uh, they kind of speak for themselves, and I have so much content out there about them that I would recommend just, you know, watching the trailer. It's on my YouTube channel. Or you can watch the trailer on Prime Video. The trailer's free to watch, of course. Uh, and then I also interviewed the composer. I interviewed the actors. I've, I've interviewed many of the people from that film on this podcast. So... I would say just match match up the episodes with the IMDb listing. Uh, the, one of the more interesting ones, though, is definitely with the composer, Lyndall Descant. And that was from season two, so that's pretty recent. But Fractals is out. It's on Prime Video. I don't know how long it'll be out for, because I know that sometimes with these independent films, uh, Amazon doesn't hold on to them forever. So if you want to just have access to both of these movies indefinitely... Just buy them. Because once you buy them, even if they take it off Prime, you still have access to it. So I'm always advocating for people to just buy these movies. You don't, have, you don't even have to watch it. Just buy it, support me, and then put it away for a rainy day. Uh, or, you know, whenever you're feeling like immersing yourself into a magnificent art house science fiction essay hybrid New York street film. Because that's basically what it is. Some say it's a mess, but personally, this is, it's the closest thing to my brain as I was, able to <laughs> I was able to produce. So if you ever wonder what's going on in my brain, death and life and fractals combined is basically my thought processes <laughs> all, all the time. Anyway, that's the product I have out right now. At the end of the episode today, I'm going to tell you about what's to come. 
and and it's mostly just books. <laughs> I've mostly been working on a lot of literature. So even though the podcast is going on hiatus um, right right now, essentially after this episode, it doesn't mean I'm gone, right? I'm on social media. And I highly recommend that everybody on social media, if you're interested in staying in touch with me, I'm active on Twitter. I'm active on Instagram. And I've been a little bit active on TikTok. I have issues with TikTok. We can talk about that. We'll see how I feel. But Twitter has been growing exponentially. I had a, for years, I had a hard time with Twitter. Like it just meant, it was making me mentally ill. Like every time I tried it, it, it was just, I couldn't believe the level of ignorance on it. I couldn't believe the, why are we debating this? All you got to do is look up the facts, blah, 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 blah. Like Twitter was driving me nuts. But then I figured out, well, if I avoid politics and I avoid kind of stressful conversations and I just ask questions, mostly focus on creativity like I do with this podcast, then suddenly Twitter attracts that the, the Twitter algorithm attracts the right people to my space. So I started asking questions, mostly rooted in creativity. And since then, Twitter has been pleasant. It's my followers have grown exponentially. So I'm much more active on Twitter. Um, I'd say just keep it civil and keep it based on create creativity and the exchange of creative ideas. Now with Instagram, I have a few Instagram accounts. And the reason is because I'm experimenting with the types of listeners or followers that kind of function on that platform. So my personal Instagram account is locked away. I don't recommend trying to friend me because I won't accept you. It's mostly just the one I use for people that I know in real life. Uh, a lot of personal photos like me going to brunch with my girlfriend. It's very boring. <laughs> so it's under lockdown. There are ones that I wouldn't mind you following. If you're interested in my creative writing, Eric Norcross author, I have one just where I am documenting visually the various writing projects that I'm working on. And my writing projects are actually very visually developed. So that's a, that's probably the most interesting page I have. I have, of course, one for the podcast, Eric Norcross Podcast, where I every week I'll update it. And then during hiatus, I'll probably not update it. Uh, but if you are looking for a way to just know if a new episode is out, you'll know by subscribing to the Eric Norcross Podcast on Instagram. And whenever you see a new bumper appear on the feed, then you know a new episode is out. You could also just subscribe to it through Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen and just listen to it that way. But it made sense to have a, a, a podcast Instagram. But then, of course, I also have my filmmaking because <laughs> I'm a filmmaker too. And so I've started experimenting with just presenting myself as a filmmaker on an account specifically for that. So I've uploaded a few short films, some experimental films, some of my trailers, some of my, my behind the scenes content. And I've also uploaded some home video content and I'm just playing around with it, seeing if I can get build a film audience. I find film audiences are really hard to, to grow. And so it made sense for me to sort of focus that separate from the writing, separate from the podcast. And of course, separate from my personal account. Anyway, those are the ones. Oh, and Fractals and Death and Life. So <laughs> Fractals Film is the handle for the movie's Instagram page. Instagram.com slash Fractals Film. And that is the official Instagram for both Death and Life and Fractals. And you can get all kinds of content on there. I've got the entire video diary series, which has been on YouTube for a while now. Uh, but the Fractals video diary series is a sort of the making of fractals. I have clips, I have trailers, I have behind the scenes imagery, movie stills, I have excerpts from this particular podcast. Uh, anytime I talk to somebody from the movie, I extract their episodes from the podcast and I upload them to the fractals Instagram. 
And I'll continue doing that throughout the course of the film's life. Uh, you know, the, the frequency will, of course, slow down as I move on to other projects, but I do plan on keeping that alive uh, as long as I can. So that's from a social media standpoint, that's, that's where I'm at. And of course, YouTube, if you're listening to this on YouTube, please make sure to subscribe and like it and all that stuff. It's really important. Uh, what else? Can I, okay, so can I just for a moment go over some of the questions I've received this past year? I, uh, <laughs> I, I get, I get them sometimes, you know, I get them through Twitter. I get them through email. I get them through my website cause I have a contact form on my website. Um, I'll have people I personally know ask me and I'll just write that down that they've asked me, even though I've answered them. I write them down anyway because I thought I always think, well, maybe you guys would like to know because you're not always here for the conversations I have off the podcast. So I chose three questions and here, here they are. So basically the first one that I wanted to answer on this show, on this particular episode was, let's see if I can read my handwriting. Can I, can I expand on how the show has changed since involving non-creative topics? Okay, so in season two, I introduced the UFO subject on the podcast and the paranormal subject and then later on the spiritual subject. And there was a bit of overlap with, with all three of those. And so... Can I expand on how the show has changed? Hasn't really changed. That's the thing, is I just introduced a subject that was fascinating to me, a subject that I wanted to talk about, and a subject that is incredibly clippable. You can understand that. I have a YouTube channel. Clipping is everything for me. If I have an episode that I don't feel is clippable, like it could be a great conversation, good podcast episode, but it's not necessarily going to do well on YouTube. The ones that do well on YouTube are the ones that are clippable. And so if I'm having a conversation with Avi Loeb about Oumuamua, I think I managed to break that down into 10 or 11 different clips. And I could probably break them down into even more clips because every time I ask him a question, we would go off on a different tangent that is uniquely interesting. And so I guess the show changed in that it became more clippable. And it taught me also where I can clip for non-UFO based episodes. So I actually ended up clipping more episodes this season than last season. Last season, I experimented with it a little bit, but you won't find many clips from season one. For For season two, I made a conscious attempt to try and clip every episode, at least during the autumn and winter. It wasn't until the latter half of winter and spring that I, that I slowed down with the clipping. Uh, because I, I felt like I wasn't really extracting the most interesting aspects of the episodes. What the UFO topic taught me was, one, how to have a conversation so that it can be clipped later. So I'm almost steering the conversations knowing that I'm going to be looking for clips. And if that sounds weird, it's Okay whatever. Like I'm, you know, this is, I'm learning, I'm experimenting. Uh, (laughs) I'm learning how to be a podcaster. I'm learning how to be a YouTuber. It doesn't, it's not second nature to me. Filmmaking at this point is second nature to me and story writing is, but this sort of media output process, it's completely alien to me. And so the bringing on the whole UFO subject has helped demystify a little bit what I'm expected to do. And so you'll find down the road in the latter half of this season, fewer episodes were clipped than at the beginning of the season, but they were clipped better. And they were clipped better because I introduced the UFO subject on the podcast. And in case you're wondering why I introduced the UFO subject on the podcast, I'm just fascinated by it. That's it. I think there's a lot going on out there that we that we don't know about. I mean, we know they're out there, but we don't know what they are. 
we don't know if they mean us well or if they mean us harm, you know? And I just, I think it's an important subject and we need to talk about it. We need to be able to talk about it openly and we need to be able to talk about it outside of, you know, UFO circles. I don't consider myself a ufologist. I don't consider myself in a UFO circle. I don't go to events. I don't go to meetings. I'm not part of MUFON. None of that. I'm just the person who recognizes this is an important subject that everyone's ignoring. The fact that everyone's ignoring it is a red flag. And one, why do so many people ignore it? And why is it so hard to get non-UFO people to actually talk about it? So that's what I was trying to do really is just can a non-UFO person talk about it with somebody who knows what they're talking about? So that's why I reached out to Colin Kelleher first and Avi Loeb and a few others. I actually reached out to four or five different people back to back um, in one evening. And in that same evening, they all got back to me. And I, I booked like at least three of those people <laughs> the same day, which never happens. Not with any of the creative people I've ever reached out to. So, excuse me. So, it was so obvious that this was a subject that I needed to talk about. Because, let me tell you, booking people onto this show is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And I'm going to be talking about that in a minute because <laughs> the next question is kind of about the guests that I've had. But the fact that in one evening, I in, in one afternoon, I should say, I came up with the idea to bring the UFO subject onto the podcast. Around 4 or 5 p.m., I send out all these emails. I send an email to Avi Loeb, to... Who, do, who else it is? To Colm Kelleher. I'm looking at my bookshelf to remember who I sent all this. Oh, I sent one out to Ron Felber's people. Ron Felber is, is an author that I had on the podcast as well. And there were a few others. In one evening... Like an hour after I sent all those emails, all of them got back to me. All of them confirmed they were interested in coming on the show. And I had managed to book Avi and Colin Kelleher simultaneously. So what happened then? Well, by then it was dark. It was around 6 or 7 p.m. And I, I'd been feeling down all day. But now I had a surge of energy because, holy crap, I just reached out to like all of these people that I've been wanting to talk to, didn't have the courage to reach out to them. And all of them at the same time got back to me and said they'd be willing to come on the show. That fires me up. So I'm like, I got to go for a walk. I got to walk this off. This is amazing. I, you know, I, I was just feeling so energized. I'm about to talk about UFOs on my podcast with people who actually have some idea about what it is people are seeing. So I go for the walk. I'm walking around my neighborhood in New York City. And my neighborhood in New York City has very specific air traffic. I am 100% familiar with all the different kinds of helicopters that we have. We have shuttles. We have like helicopter shuttles to and from the airports. We have police helicopters. Sometimes we have military helicopters. And we have air traffic that sometimes you'll see air traffic headed over to LaGuardia. Sometimes you'll see it going towards Newark. I know what the patterns look like depending on the time of year, depending on the weather. So I'm out for this walk and I see some strange lights. I see some strange lights over Arthur Kill, which is a, it's a waterway between Staten Island and New Jersey. That, though, that's not aircraft that I know of. They were weird. They were moving weirdly. And then they zipped off. So I keep walking. And then I look, I get the weird urge to look up again. And kind of to the right of the moon, I see one of those sort of dots of light that moves, move quickly, stop move quickly, irrationally, stop, and then zip off. And I actually described a UFO like that in my book, Squatterism at High Noon, which you can get on Amazon. That was my first UFO I ever saw. It was from the roof of 12 Warren Street. And it's one of the most common types of 
UAP phenomena people will report where it's it's a light that's really far away but bright enough that you can see it and it's moving unrealistically fast it stops hovers and then it moves unrealistically fast in all these erratic directions stops and then it just zips off uh so that's that's what I saw for the second time in my life. I saw one of those. So then I turn and now I'm looking down a hill and I see all of these lights like a stadium, but not a stadium because we actually have a stadium in the North Shore. So it wasn't our stadium. But I see all these lights like a stadium hovering over the North Shore. And then I blinked and they were gone. <laughs> that's not all. I, as I'm descending down the hill, I see two orbs of light str like streaking across just above the surface of the water across New York Harbor. And it's going north to south between Staten Island and Brooklyn faster than any helicopter could go. I mean, so fast. And they had, they were so bright that I could see the reflections of the orbs off the surface of the water. Super, super weird. And all of these sightings back to back in one evening's walk. I think I was only out for about an hour and a half. The same evening I booked three of my top guests on the podcast, all to talk about UFOs or the paranormal. So that is really cool. When I got back in, I knew that I really had to come prepared because this was a subject that I'm supposed to talk about. I know it has nothing to do with creativity or the creative process. And some of you will be like, well, this is, this is all woo-woo. This is all, well, how can we trust what you have to say? I really don't care. <laughs> I'm just going to get it out there because that's, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what we, we are supposed to do. We're supposed to let people know what we see, what we hear, have dialogue about it. And I'm not putting it out there so that you can shoot it down. I'm not putting it out there so that you can rationalize what it is or is not. I really don't care and I don't want to hear about it. But you should know that, one, I'm obsessed with aviation. I know what aviation looks like. Uh, and I know what our aviators are currently capable of doing both in civilian and military aircraft. And what I saw was not of this world. And man, these, uh, these ended up being some of my favorite non, not, uh, well, some of my favorite episodes, but as I'm pretty sure that when I do other non-creative episodes, these are still going to be some of my favorite non-creative episodes. So I recommend the one with Col there's two with Colin Kelleher because I split his conversation up into two. There's one with Avi Loeb, and I really like the one that I did with um, excuse me, Ron Felber. I thought Ron Felber great, gave a great interview, and we didn't just talk about his book Mojave Incident, which is his UFO book, but we talked about his whole career, and I'm really proud of that episode. Because I've always wanted to do one where I'm able to just kind of go over every book somebody's written and just have them go off on it. And and so that was sort of my interview with Rod Felber was we got to just kind of do career highlights. So that was pretty cool. So, yeah, the, the, app, the, the podcast didn't really change that much except in how it functions on YouTube. But I changed a lot. My mind... Uh, my mind has uh, shifted a bit and being more open to things that previously I wasn't open to before. So I can, I can safely admit, comfortably admit, I should say, I can comfortably admit that having the UFO subject on my podcast made me more open-minded as a podcaster than I was before. And that's something, that's something of value. So here's the next question. How come all your guests are white? <laughs> I actually, I get that. I get variations of that same question 
uh, often. So if you look at the, the pictures of everybody on my guest list, most of the time they're just like white men, sometimes white women. And really it's, I invite everybody. I've invited everybody from all walks of life that are doing anything remotely interesting. And the, the biggest problem I have as a producer of this particular podcast is getting people to say yes to coming on the show, getting people to agree to coming on the show. Most people don't agree to come onto the show. Believe it or not, with with the eighty nine odd episodes I've done, two full seasons, it's still really hard to get people to commit to coming onto the show. I would say in the thick of the winter, when I was really like working on sending out emails to people uh, to get them interested in the show, I'd send out about ten per day. And I would work Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday on these emails. So Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, 10 emails per day. Maybe two or three will get back to me. And out of those two or three, one person will accept. This is why it was such a shocker when these UFO people all back to back just blanket accepted. They blanket agreed to talk with me. I'm like, oh, what a relief. Because one, I was able to stack stagger all the episodes ahead of time and maybe take a little bit of a breather from all these emails. But yeah, I mean, it's just the rejection rate from some, some people is just, it's really high and it's even higher for people who work in film because filmmakers are very insulated by PR and agents and managers and a lot of those guys just want their filmmakers on the today show or some big mainstream production. So a lot of them will either ghost me or ask for metrics, which I couldn't possibly give them. So really uh, it's not that I'm deliberately looking for a certain race to appear on the show. I'm just, I'm reaching out to everybody and only a handful are getting back to me. And out of those handful, very few actually commit to coming on the show. That's it. That's the reason the show is what it is. I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. I want to talk to everybody. Believe me. You know who I invited to? I've invited people who, <laughs> they're mostly LA based people, but they specialize in this culture where they take vehicles, they break them down and rebuild them with hydraulic technology. It's an interesting culture that I know nothing about. And I wanted to talk about it on the show because I see it as an art form that is really, really cool and really, really interesting. And, and I want to learn about it. And I was interested in learning about it on the podcast. Uh, they call them low riders or and it's low rider culture. <laughs> so uh, all, the, you know, all the people I reached out to, the, to, to, to come onto the podcast never got back to me. Or one did, actually, but he's just like, nah, he accused me of being a cop and then decided he didn't want anything to do with me. So <laughs> I'm doing what I can. Like, I'm interested in everyone. I'm interested in cultures. I'm interested in just kind of bringing the world together with ideas. And uh, I'm not 100% convinced that everybody else has that same sort of optimistic ambition. So, but I'll continue to try for sure. Yeah. There's, there's what I want to do, what I'm trying to do, but only what the world will let me do. So there are bigger issues going on like guns, women's rights, war. I assume that they're talking about the war in the Ukraine because nobody ever reaches out to me to talk about the war in the places where war is always going on. Why don't I ever talk about these things? Okay, so... One, this is an arts podcast that is meant to inspire people. And so if I go off on gun rights, it's just going to be a, a shit show for an hour. If, I go on a, if I'm going to go off on women's rights, again, it's going to be... A shit show for an hour. 
and it's going to be, it's going to appeal to people in the same bubble as me, you know, I'm pro-choice. And so if I do an episode about that, the only people who are going to tolerate it are the people who are also pro-choice. And I'm not interested in creating people, uh, in creating content for people in a political bubble. Okay. And I don't know how to have a conversation about politics that would appeal to both sides and maybe get each side to consider, you know, to see, I guess, the perspective of the opponent, the opposing side, which is what I would want to do. I just don't have that in me, especially with something like firearms and women's rights. Like, I don't really care what the other side thinks. Women should have the right to choose and we should have less guns, especially, and and not only less guns, but we should absolutely not have access to military grade hardware like the AR-15. And you don't need me on this podcast preaching about that because the only episodes I'm interested in doing is me telling you that we shouldn't have guns, that women should have rights. And that's that. And I don't, honestly, I admit that I don't have the emotional intelligence to have a more productive conversation beyond than, beyond the whole, well, this is what obviously should be. And if you don't see it that way, you know, then there's something wrong with you. Like, I understand that from a political standpoint, I see the world that way. So it doesn't make sense for me to be the guy having that conversation. Because if, t- if somebody's too stupid to understand why we should not have access to AR-15s, listen, listen to how I'm putting this. I'm saying if somebody's too stupid to understand and accept that they should not own an AR-15, that civilians should not own an AR-15, <laughs> do you really want somebody who says that sentence to actually be hosting conversations about politics? I don't think so. And the same thing with the war in the Ukraine. Okay? One, it why is the United States not stepping in more? Do you really want somebody talking about the war in the Ukraine from the perspective of we should be doing more? No. You don't because... The moment you have somebody advocating for American involvement in geopolitical affairs, we, you know, I just, one, yeah, I I guess I do believe we could do more from a military standpoint, but we're not going to because there are more responsible people than me, one, in power and able to actually find other ways to deal with the Russian threat. Obviously, I'm not qualified. Obviously, I'm not emotionally intelligent enough for it. So it doesn't make sense for me to bring it onto the podcast. It would be embarrassing to the subject matters and to the people who agree with me. Like, everybody who agrees with me could probably talk about this more intellectually than I can. So... Obviously, if you haven't figured out by now, I'm generally pretty left and I'm generally pretty anti-war, except when it comes to Ukraine, in which case I think the U.S. should absolutely step in and kick Russia out of all the territories that Russia is trying to take from Ukraine. But I'm also a child in in my thinking. I know that there are better ways to achieve and ends. I do believe in diplomacy. I just don't have the emotional intelligence to discuss diplomatic ideas. And I accept that about myself. So that's why I don't talk about politics or the hot button issues on this podcast. And I'm not going to. This is it. This is all you're going to hear from me about this topic. I'm done. So, but you know, one of the interviews I have lined up for season three is this guy who goes around the world seizing airplanes that were previously leased by Russia, by Russian airlines, 
by Russian companies. Now, that's not a political conversation, though. It's root. I mean, it's wouldn't happen if it wasn't for the war in Ukraine and shutting down Russia's economy with the rest of the world. But I love the idea of having a conversation with the guy who's actually going around seizing airplanes that were leased by Russia, seizing Russian aviation assets. That, to me, is an interesting conversation that I can have without being too emotionally invested and, I guess, being erratic about the topic. So that's something that I have in the works for season three. And I really hope that uh, that actually happens because that's a fascinating topic. As you, as you heard earlier, I am obsessed with aviation, so that's really the reason why. Um, yeah, so that's that. I've admitted to the fact that I only talk about things that I can talk about professionally. <laughs> so here's what to expect from me from a creative standpoint in 2022, the remainder of this year. I am dropping a new novel for the first time since 2016. It's called Saratoga Landmine. Actually, 2015. Saratoga Landmine. Saratoga Landmine is the first of four books in a series. Uh, it's a science fiction horror series. It's absolutely disturbing. Uh, I've talked a little bit about it on one of my podcasts with Phoenix Nicholson. He was asking me about it. So you can expect that to drop in June, later June, or at early July. The latest will be early July. Saratoga Landmine. It's been in the works for a very long time. I started this novel in 2016. And I am finally wrapping it up and I couldn't be happier. And then I'm going to get to work on the sequel. I've already been developing the sequel. But there's four books in this series. It's it's uh, science fiction horror-ish. I'll introduce it more in depth in a separate video on my YouTube channel. But definitely look for that if you're interested in science fiction horror. Uh, and then later, hopefully before the holidays, I'm going to release another book called Running Guns Across State Lines. Running Guns Across State Lines is a collection of experimental literature, verse, and essays. And it's kind of all about using art to, to deal with the pains that, I, that I've carried with me throughout my life. A lot of the pain is rooted in my experiences growing up. And so I've managed to take all of that and, and turn it into sort of a philosophical collection of work. And that collection is called Running Guns Across State Lines. And I'm hoping to have that wrapped up and released before the holidays. On Kindle Vela, I will be releasing either monthly or bi-monthly, depending on how production goes. It's a hybrid novel and graphic novel called The Vacation Land Chronicles. And The Vacation Land Chronicles is a, an epic story set in my hometown of Portland, Maine, and the islands of Casco Bay, Maine. Uh, and that's all in the Gulf of Maine. So that'll kick off on Kindle Vela. It's uh, the Vacation Land Chronicles, all set in Maine. It's been in development for 20 years, give or take. And, you know, there's, there's murder mystery, there's personal relationships being developed and saved and other such things. And, and it's, of course, there's different aspects of the story is set in different decades of the 20th century. So it's very scenic in the way it feels. So you can look for that, too. I wanted to make a film this summer, but I wasn't able to get a project off the ground. It's been very tough because money's so tight here and money tight is everywhere. So a lot of people aren't volunteering their time on passion projects. So I will not be making a film this year as far as I know, though I'm always open to it. We'll see what happens. Next year, 
my sequel to Saratoga Landmine will drop. Depending on how production of that novel goes. I've been writing it like crazy. I've been handwriting notes. I've been handwriting scenes. I've been developing it. I have the outline pretty much intact. I just I want to finalize some of the details before I type it up. But I'll announce that and I'll announce the title at some point later this year. I will also have a, another collection of experimental verse, poetry, and essays. It'll be my follow-up to Running Guns Across State Lines. I don't have a title for this one yet, but it'll be entirely about moving to New York City and my experiences living in New York for the first 10 years of my life here. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting sort of coming-of-age stories and lessons that can be learned from this collection. And so that's something that's been in development a while. Vacation Land Chronicles will continue into 2023 as a Kindle Vela ebook release, chapter by chapter. And of course, I'm continuing to stay open to another possible film, depending on how things go, especially economically. So. That's the podcast for season two. I really hope that uh, you join me again for season three and uh, let's keep the stakes low and just have a conversation that keeps us inspired to want to create, to want to collaborate, and to want to move on to great things. Thank you. Have a great summer and I'll see you in September.